Hi, everyone. It's Joe Venary, the host of Fit Insider, the show where I talk with the entrepreneurs, executives, and investors who are redefining the business of fitness and wellness. Today, I'm joined by Alexa Meyer. Alexa is the co-founder and CEO of COA, a mental health and emotional fitness company offering therapist-led classes. In this episode, we talk about COA's mission to become the Nike of mental health, why we should treat mental fitness like going to the gym, how in-person community-focused classes help destigmatize the idea of going to therapy, and why professional basketball player Kevin Love invested in the company. A quick reminder before we get into today's show. Every Tuesday, we send a weekly newsletter filled with insights and analysis on the business of fitness and wellness. Join other decision makers and industry operators by subscribing at insider.fit.co. Let's get into it. Hi, Alexa. Welcome to Fit Insider. Thanks for joining us. Hey, Joe. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, and I'm excited to chat. Looking forward to the conversation. And just to kick things off, usually just ask folks, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're working on at COA. Yeah, so I'm Alexa, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of COA, which is the world's first gym for mental health. And you may be wondering what that is, and I always like to start with a personal story that'll be quick. Prior to starting COA, I was a VP of growth at a at an analytics startup in the Bay Area, and got to a point where I was working 18 hour days and feeling a little bit unfulfilled overall with my career choices and just kind of wanting to work on my emotions, my mental health in a more proactive way. And I started the process that many may have gone through, which is trying to find a therapist, which can be extremely daunting, overwhelming, and high friction. And when I finally found someone, I walked into their office and was sort of underwhelmed by the experience of going to therapy because often therapists are working in these dingy offices in the back of buildings somewhere. They have no technology to manage their practice. Um, What was really striking to me is there was no community. And to me, that felt really perpetuating of some of the stigma and the hesitation I was already feeling around like, is therapy even right for me? And when I was walking home from that first therapy session, I simultaneously passed a soul cycle and an equinox and a Barry's boot camp. And I was like, why isn't there something like this? But for mental health, why do we not have classes that help people work on themselves more proactively like we have with physical fitness? And that moment was sort of when COA was, was initially born. And what we're offering now, and we're, we just raised a $3 million seed round last year, is a gym for mental health that combines therapist-led group emotional fitness classes with one-on-one therapy for those that want to go deeper. Awesome. And there's a lot in there to get to. So definitely want to kind of dig in. The first thing you, and I've seen it mentioned and and you've kind of phrased it this way, uh, a gym for mental health, uh, emotional fitness studio. Um, I think the other one was maybe a mental fitness company. And so can you take us like, obviously the tagline is meant to, in a way, brand it and say, this is supposed to be about community in the same way of going to Soul Cycle is, but what does that kind of tagline represent? And then going a little bit deeper, like what does that experience look like from the user perspective? Yeah, I love this question. So the tagline really represents our fundamental belief that mental health is something that everybody on this planet has. We all have a mind, we all have emotions, and therefore we all have mental health. And just like going to the gym where you work on your body very proactively, we've come a long way as a society in accepting physical fitness as something we do. It's integrated into our daily routine. We believe that mental health and working on it should be a proactive practice that is visible, rooted in community, and can be super accessible and fun, just like going to uh, your favorite boutique fitness studio. From a user experience perspective, what we offer is these therapist-led group classes that enable you to work on key skills that you're going to be able to use for the course of your life when it comes to your mental health. So we teach things like resilience, self-awareness, communication, mindfulness, curiosity, all within a class structure that allows you to not only learn, but actually practice those skills in real time alongside other folks. More specifically right now, and and our vision is to be the first line of defense for mental health and have classes for all sorts of different challenges, populations, and themes. We launched last week with two cohorts of eight-week series. One is for leaders. So sort of the acknowledgement that as a leader, a manager, a founder, or an executive, your work has a big impact on on how you feel and, and on your mental health. But secondly, you're in a really amazing role where you have the opportunity to create 
a psychologically safe space for your team to grow and, and to work on themselves as well. So the Emotionally Fit Leadership Series is geared toward folks who, who want to work on, on themselves as it relates to how they show up at work. And the second eight-week series that we have is geared toward everyday mental wellness. So people who recognize that taking care of their mental health is, is a priority and something that they that they want to work on. And they learn the seven traits of emotional fitness through that eight week series. Yeah. It's great to, to see all that come together. Certainly now with kind of pandemic induced anxiety and stress, burnout, all the things that go along with that. I was curious to hear you kind of talk about it. So often you have a founder who, who they have a personal problem. You mentioned going to the therapist and being super underwhelmed. I've also had that experience. So in your case, feeling like wasn't meeting your needs, and then you can't find the the solution you want, so you see, you set out to create it. And then as you're doing that, one of the things that I read was you started doing mental health pop ups to help folks, whether it was seek out therapy or get access to therapy. Uh, and then it evolved from there. You mentioned raising a seed round and continuing to grow. What was the kind of vision like initially as you set out down this path? Was it like, hey, we're going to build this platform in the the gym for mental health? Or was it an evolution to kind of get from where you were initially to where you are now? Yeah, our vision was always, why does a gym for mental health not exist? Why are there not street level mental health studios um, of the fundamental belief that like that visibility is what can decrease the stigma, right? I think the reason the stigma is so high in the mental health space is, as I mentioned before, is like you walk down the street and you don't see people working on their mental health. You don't see mental health spaces. You don't see therapist offices. All of the resources are super tucked away. And so that, again, perpetuates the stigma. And so the vision was if we create a mental health gym that makes working on your mental health really visible and really accessible, we can reduce the stigma and increase the accessibility and people's willingness to actually do work on themselves. And so from day one, that was the vision. And the second question was, well, how do we test this? How do we know if people actually want this? How do we know if people will show up to a mental health gym? Um, and most importantly, how do we know that it'll be effective in helping people feel better or work on the challenges that they have? And so that's where the concept of the mental health pop-up was born with two goals. Let's reduce the stigma and and increase the accessibility. And the pop-ups were a way for people to come in and try out therapy. And we made it really easy for them to just do a quick 30-minute trial session with a therapist that was matched to them based on their needs. But the second thing is we wanted to increase that visibility. And so at those pop-ups, we had group classes and group workshops that were on things like managing burnout or building resilience or making better decisions or feeling more confident. And we held them at public spaces like WeWorks. And the the reason we did that is because we wanted to see like, well, people show up to like a really public place to do something as stigmatized as, you know, working on, I'm doing air quotes right now, but like working on your mental health. And that was a big, a big test point for us. But second, we wanted to know if we had it at a place like a WeWork, would we see community start to form? Would we see people coming to the workshops? Would we see people talking to one another after their therapy session? And would we see other people that happen to be in WeWork that day become interested in therapy as a result of just seeing other people doing it? And what we saw as a result is when every pop-up we sold, sold out, or we did 10 of them across the country. The second thing we saw was that those group classes that we had ended up resulting in people becoming interested in doing the one-on-one therapy sessions that we were having at the pop-ups. We also saw that people were hanging out at our pop-ups, even after their session, they were talking to one another, building community with one another. We've since heard stories that people have made like lifelong friends that they met at the pop-ups we held two to three years ago. And the third thing that we saw was that people did come up to us that worked at WeWork or that were working at WeWork that day and were like, what's going on here? Like, can I try a therapy session? I saw that you've like commandeered one of the conference rooms and turned it into a therapy room. Like, what's this all about? And I'm really interested in trying one out. So that was super successful and we were super fulfilled by the outcomes of that. And we knew that, uh, you know, an official gym for mental health had to exist. 
Yeah, it's great to hear how that came together and was, you know, validated what you were feeling and seeing yourself. I think it's it's interesting. Obviously, the the kind of sexy version is a, a soul cycle for mental health, right? It's, you know, people who are aspiring to live a healthier lifestyle and are maybe engaged in that in some way and they're meeting other like-minded people. And another way is like support groups exist, right? Like people have been getting together and talking about things, maybe not in such a public way as you were positioning it, but certainly something like a Weight Watchers around another kind of stigmatized subject of weight loss or weight gain or just not being comfortable in your body and wanting to improve. So taking right. that idea um, was certainly there. The thing that comes up a lot is the stigma and how do we deal with it as it relates to mental health, encouraging people to build community and and seek out solutions for themselves and work on it, being proactive. What what do you attribute the the willingness is if if that's even the right word to engage in something like this in a public way is it just younger generation that the need is so high that maybe all these things in terms of like just timing are coming together have you thought about like why this is working at this particular time yeah i think that there is a combination of reasons i'll speak to sort of like the macro like effects of what's going on in our society today and then i'll speak to our solution specifically and why it sort of reduced some of the barriers. So I think on, on a macro level, we have never been more burnt out. The world has never been more depressed. The world has never been more anxious. Why? Number of reasons, but I think one of them is so many of our relationships are now being replaced by technology, right? We're on our phones more than ever. We're working longer hours than ever because we have access to, to, to work at all hours of the day. And so there's a lack of separation. And while a lot of that, the, you know, the technology has enabled incredible benefits, um, I think it has brought us to a point where we are, as I mentioned, more stressed out than ever. And so there's that need has increased. The second thing is we know that loneliness is a huge contributor to one's sense of mental health and well-being. And because we are now like millennials and Gen Z are like the loneliest generation because we're replacing so many relationships with technology that is also ushering in a desire and a need to, to feel better and, and for mental health resources. From a more solution-oriented perspective, what we believe is nothing has to be wrong with you to benefit from working on your mental health. So this isn't a space where you are expected to come in and talk about all of the things that are wrong with you and and we have to fix you. We don't believe that anybody needs to be fixed. We believe that we're all human and all of our challenges are are completely valid. And so I think even just that shift in framing where people can come in and be like, oh, this is not only a way for me to feel better, this is actually a way for me to grow and learn more about myself and integrate healthy habits into my everyday lifestyle has helped people feel more comfortable coming into this sort of setting and and working on themselves. Again, it's it's very similar to to physical fitness. If you look back, you know, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, people weren't really working out as aggressively as they are now. Um, there's a number of reasons for that, but I think one of the things that drove the physical fitness revolution is the brands that have, have made it aspirational, that have made it fun to work on, that have made it community-based and growth-oriented. You know, Nike and the Lululemons of the world have done an incredible job of this. Yeah. Do you think, do you see yourself as aspiring as a company to be that brand, to be the Nike or the Lululemon or what have you of mental health? Yes, we are building the Nike of mental health or, you know, lack of a better analogy. And it's inevitable. There will be a mental health and mental fitness company. That is your first line of defense for when, where you go to work on yourself. Um, One thing we say is the best work of your life will be the work you do on yourself. And COA is building the way to do that work through our classes and and our one-on-one therapy. And we're very, very, very excited to see that come to life. Yeah. And rightfully so. It's it's a huge (laughs) work on it literally for the rest of your life, always aspiring to and somehow be better. I think it's interesting. You also hear somebody like a calm saying they are Nike of the mind, right? And that's kind of meditation and mindfulness, but mental health is kind of now being defined in so many different ways across meditation, mindfulness, therapy, clinically validated programs. Just what are your thoughts on the, the landscape and where COA fits in recognizing that, you know, there's some things sit in like this wellness bucket, some things sit in a healthcare bucket, and then there's all types yeah. of different things in between. Yeah. So I think there's sort of, I'm going to try to like paint you a like four quadrant picture. 
there's the reactive to proactive spectrum, right? So you've got your really clinical healthcare solutions um, uh, and things that are working on kind of like better diagnoses, better delivery of prescription medicine, um, alternatives to prescription medicine, like psychedelics, for example, helping people treat really acute problems, really acute symptoms. And then you have the proactive approach where people are investing in their wellness. They're investing in becoming better versions of themselves. And those are you know, the calms and the head spaces of the world. And by the way, there's can be overlap. You could be somebody that is taking advantage of a better healthcare offering while you're also in being proactive and, and investing in your overall wellness. And then there's the other side, which is like, is it individual or is it, is it group based, right? So is this something you're doing all by yourself or are you um, benefiting from the advantages of a community where, you know, you're learning together, you're growing together, you're having accountability with one another. And so where COA sits is we are on the proactive side of the spectrum and we are a community-based approach with our classes. So you're learning something new about yourself. This isn't a one-size-fits-all approach, but you're also doing so alongside community. And one thing that we say is mental health, it's an individual journey, right? There's no one-size-fits-all for mental health. And what's going to work for you is not necessarily going to work for me, but it is a communal pursuit and it can be, you know, the work can be done, but it's a lot more enjoyable when you're doing it alongside other people. Sure. And to that point, the the community aspect, the the pop-ups, uh, seeing other people working on this and being a part of that community, was the plan always to have the kind of telehealth version, the remote, the online, or was that spurred on by COVID or, or now are you imagining kind of like a hybrid of these programs where you're doing it both online and in person? Yeah, our vision is to help everybody regardless of where they live. And so there's inherent limits to ha- to being to only having a brick and mortar space. And so the only thing that's changed since COVID is the order in which we launched COA into the world. So we were initially planning, like, let's start brick and mortar and really build a small but highly engaged community, build the visibility that I mentioned. So having retail level studios, build the brand, and then start to scale the classes digitally so that people all over the world, even if they're not in a city where COA has a location or there's someone that just can't get to that location, can benefit from these classes. With COVID, obviously, the brick and mortar plan is on hold, but the silver lining is we've been able to impact far more people all around the country and all around on people from different countries have showed up to our classes as well. And we would never have been able to do that this early if we had just focused on brick and mortar from the onset. So there's been a bit of a silver lining there, which has been really awesome and fulfilling to be able to serve people in this time of need. Sure. And, you know, with having kind of these dual strategies, one being, you know, kind of forced into action or motion a little bit earlier, how do you think about, and I don't even know if, if growth, quote unquote, I'm also doing air quotes now, growth is the right <laughs> is the right word. When you think about, you know, we're a mental health company and we somehow want people to feel like this is a safe space. Also, do we want to be overbearing in terms of like customer acquisition? Like how do you keep both of those thoughts in your mind as you think about growing the company? Yeah. The way I think about, so if you're, if your question is like, how do we think about, about marketing and acquiring customers? Right. Yeah. So I have, I have, I have lots of views on this. My background is in, is in brand, brand strategy. And part of my beliefs and when you're building a brand is how can you always be adding value from any layer of the funnel, whether it's the awareness stage to the conversion stage is add value to your, to your community, even if they're not your customers yet. So when we think about acquiring customers and customer acquisition, it's we're one creating things that help people, even if they never become paid customers of our product. But two, the other philosophy is this is new. Like there is no gym for mental health and we're fighting against an existing hesitation and a stigma that's been around for years. And so in order to combat that, one of the things we think about is we have to make it easy for people to try this out. We have to remove as many barriers as possible for people to actually experience like what is a mental health class. So this overlaps with adding value, but we host a lot of free classes and free trial classes so that people can just get a sense of what is this? What does an emotional burpee or emotional push-up actually look like? And how might it benefit me? Is that terminology? Like, is that how you talk about it in the classes? Like liking going down this, you know, comparison to exercise, even more comparing it to different exercises and modalities and framing it that way? Yeah, we do. And we do it playfully. But the reason we, we've used it is because 
when you go to work out at the gym or at your favorite boutique fitness class, it can be enjoyable, but it's not always easy work. It's hard. And we don't want to sugarcoat what working on your mental health is, is always easy. Like it's, it's hard work investing in yourself and your self-care and your personal growth can, can be a commitment. And so that's why we playfully use things like emotional burpee or emotional push-up because you kind of do work up an emotional sweat in some of our classes, right? You do, you are asked to challenge yourself. You are asked to dig a little bit deeper and learn something new about yourself. And you are asked sometimes to be a little bit vulnerable um, with others or with yourself. And so that can sometimes be tough work, but it's worth it. So thinking about growth, adding value, also removing barriers so people can try this and get them a taste of it. Right. And so they're, they're experiencing it and they're, they're enjoying it. Also on the topic of growth, you mentioned it having raised a $3 million seed round. What do you think about, you know, putting that capital to use? Are there specific milestones or priorities that you have outlined? I'm sure that there are. So I guess the question is, uh, what are those milestones and priorities? Yeah. So some of the things that we're investing in is our curriculum and our classes, right? So we want to be able to offer classes that are themed to all sorts of different populations and, and challenges. So thinking about how do we go from emotionally fit leadership to emotionally fit parenting, emotionally fit couple, emotional fitness for anxiety, emotional fitness for overcoming a major setback or grief. The second thing that we're thinking about from a product perspective is how do we leverage technology to create a really immersive and live experience for mental health, for the mental health classes? And then second, how do we help people continue their mental and emotional fitness practice outside of class based on the things that they've learned in class? And then we previously talked about the the brick and mortar aspect. Are you thinking about that as a major focus as, well, at least the U.S. begins to reopen, uh, dedicating some of those dollars to that? Or is that kind of secondary to this overall direction around the themed classes and expanding kind of, you know, that addressable market, so to speak? Yeah. Once the world is ready to safely reopen and people are able to gather in in groups and meet their therapists in person, we will have this incredible online class community, but we will be then focusing as well on opening up our physical locations. Do you imagine those to be standalone or, you know, you mentioned previously doing it in like a WeWork, going into an existing, whatever the building is, could be corporate locations, could be different fitness studios, uh, gyms, or, you know, co-working spaces, or these would be like COA branded locations. The first few will be COA branded locations because we want to own the user experience and make sure it's the best possible experience for every step of the way from the moment you entered, from the moment you leave. And the second thing that's very important to us that I've kind of said a few times throughout this is the visibility piece is so important, right? So it's, it's making it, it known, making it visible, making it feel like a, not only just a safe space to come into, but an exciting and vibrant space for people to come into. And so that user journey um, and having uh ability to thoughtfully influence that is really important to us, especially at the beginning. Yeah. That brand piece, again, it's, I think will continue to come up and be central to everything. Another interesting piece about the investment was that Kevin Love, he's a professional basketball player, participated in the round. He had, if anybody follows the space or even just in general, social media, he's been outspoken about his own battles with kind of mental health. I think he wrote an article in the Players' Tribune about it, and then he invested in the round. So how did that come together? And was that something you reached out to him, he got in touch, uh, and what kind of motivated him to, to get involved? Yeah, Kevin Love is one, I just want to say, after getting to know him a little better, just like an incredibly genuine and kind human being. He has been advocating for mental health for a long time since he had his own experiences and, and challenges on the court. And so he's made a number of investments in the kind of health and wellness space, but he'd been looking for a mental health company that aligned with his values of both making mental health more accessible, but also he was really excited about the group and community aspect to COA. And so when he found out about us, we got in touch and learned a little bit more about each other. And it's just been uh, an incredibly fun and fulfilling collaboration so far. Yeah, I think as it relates to growing the the brand and awareness, I've seen him a, a couple places, you know, speaking highly of what you're building and how it aligns with, you know, his own experiences and, and kind of desire to shine a spotlight on this. Do you look at it as 
some other companies and especially across the wellness space, let's leverage influencers, let's leverage athlete investors or high profile investors to grow this brand. Or is it just like kind of an added benefit that he happens to be who he is? Is that like a strategic move or is it just like an added benefit? I think, again, I feel like a broken record here, but it comes back to, right, we're fighting this consumer and societal stigma, right? So when we see people that we admire that are, you know, objectively successful, so they're NBA players or they're celebrities or they're founders and CEOs that are well-known, speaking openly about their mental health and their challenges and the value of doing this work on yourself proactively, that helps people feel more comfortable, getting involved in doing this work themselves or reaching out for support. And so I think it is strategic to partner with, with people that, that have the thing that I would say is they have a genuine story to tell. Like they're not just a microphone for a microphone's sake. There's aligned values. And, and before we decided to bring Kevin on, we actually had him do our classes to make sure that this is something that he actually got value from um, and that he could speak about it genuinely. Yeah. It kind of, creates a whole different opportunity in this category as it relates to mental health. You've seen it a little bit with Calm in terms of using athletes or celebrities to do content, but Mm -hmm. not so much down the path of like, particularly as it relates to mental health. Oh, by the way, we're going to leverage folks who have this personal story to tell um, to help grow the brand, whether that's as an ambassador, as an investor, um, an influencer. Uh, Yeah. So I think it could be super interesting as you continue to, to plot that course. Speaking of and kind of looking forward, we're early in 2021, you know, Last year, you raised the seed round. Obviously, now things are are probably starting to ramp back up as the world hopefully gets to reopening. What's on the radar? What are you most excited about looking forward to as we get into now spring? Yeah. So I'll speak to an internal thing and then an external thing. And then I'll also share a personal excitement. So internally, we're just so excited about growing the team. I think one of the unexpected privileges of, of being the CEO of a mental health company is learning and working with incredible clinicians. So we, we recently, a few months ago, hired a head of emotional fitness. Her name's Dr. Vanita Sandhu and just experienced as a clinical psychologist, but also as a world-class facilitator and, and learning curriculum developer has been amazing. Our co-founder and chief clinical officer, Dr. Emily Anhal, is like one of a kind and one of the most brilliant human beings I've ever met. And then all the other therapists that are on our team, it's just, that feels like a big privilege to me. So I'm excited to continue um, growing our team. On the external side, as I mentioned, I think we're just, it's been very, very uh, rewarding and humbling to see people come to our classes. And I attend a lot of our classes as well as a participant um, and see the change that they're able to make in their lives as a result. And so the thing that I'm thinking about the most is how do we help them continue to practice what they've been learning inside of these classes? And second, how do we help them to continue to build community with one another outside of the classroom? And then personally, I would say I am so excited to go to a packed Italian restaurant in (laughs) New York with all my friends and just celebrate, honestly, getting through the last year or two years or however long it will be when we finally can do that again and give people hugs, hugs I really miss. So, yeah, I I think anything in person with people, uh, especially around some good food and and, and drink will be uh, welcomed for everyone. Uh, Can't come soon enough. And uh, on that note, I think that's a good place to get you out of here. And, And last thing, where can people get in touch? They're interested in learning more and potentially giving Koa a try. Yeah. So our, our website is joinkoa.com and all our social media, Instagram, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn is at join, J-O-I-N, Koa. So you can follow us there. And then we offer intro to emotional fitness classes if you're interested in trying out. And then we also have the eight week series and all of those can be found on our website. Awesome. I definitely hope folks check that out, encourage them to do that and, and just appreciate you making time. Looking forward to sharing this conversation. Yeah, absolutely. This has been really fun. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks everyone for listening to today's episode. For more from Fit Insider, visit insider.fit.co and subscribe to our weekly newsletter for insights and analysis on the business of fitness and wellness. Then go ahead and subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. See you next time.